Let A be a matrix whose column vectors are given as A1, A2, up to AN. And let's be more specific. Let's say it's an M by N matrix right here. So I want you to recall the definition of the column space which we had introduced previously. The column space of a matrix A, which we denote as COL of A, uh, sometimes we put parentheses around this just to emphasize it here, but col of A, this is the span of the column vectors of the matrix. Now because the column space is the span of vectors, this implies that the column space is a subspace. Now I want you to notice here that it's a subspace of the vector space Fm, where M is the number of rows it has. So there will be n columns inside of the matrix, but each column contains m entries. And so we see that the column space is a subspace of Fm. That's actually why in the first place we called it the column space as opposed to something else. Uh, this was this was a, a premonition of this notion of subspaces we'd introduce later on. The column space of a, of a is the set of all vectors b, which belong to Fm, for which Ax equals b is consistent. Basically, can b be written as a linear combination of the columns of A? And so I just want to remind us of an example of how we would do such a thing. Uh, in this example, take the matrix A to be this 3 by 3 matrix, 1, 8, 7, 7, 6, 9, and 8, 7, 6. And then take the vector 3, 3, 7. And we're going to work mod 11 in this example right here. We want to determine whether B belongs to the column space of A or not. So to determine whether B is, is inside the column space of A, we have to determine whether B is a linear combination of the column vectors of A or not. This is the same as solving the linear equation uh, I should say that the matrix equation AX equals B that corresponds to a linear system. And that linear system we have set up ready to go right here. Uh, we want to solve the associated augmented, well, we, so we solve the linear system associated to this augmented matrix, uh, which we have right here. So let's say we want to, we take the pivot in the first position. We're working on seven, but for the most part, the arithmetic is going to be mostly the same as if you're working on the real numbers. To get rid of the seven that's below the one, we'll take row two minus seven times row one. And to get rid of the eight, we're gonna get row three minus eight times row one. So doing the first one, we're gonna get minus seven. On the next one, this is where we have to be a little bit more careful, right? On the next one, we're gonna get seven times, se not seven, I'm sorry. No, that is right. We wanna take seven times eight seven times eight, and we're gonna subtract that from six. But we're, of course, we're working we're working mod 11. So we do wanna reduce things as we go. So if we take eight times seven, be aware that's 56. But if you take away a multiple of, of 11, like 55 being the first one, we're really just subtracting one when you're working mod seven. And for the next example, if we take seven times seven, that's, that's normally gonna be 49, right? But 49, if you take away 44, is gonna be five. So we're really just subtracting five when we're working mod 11. And then the last one here, if you take, uh, if you take 21 times seven, 21 times seven, that's a negative 21. But if you add 22 to that, that's actually equal to one. And so I'm just gonna add one right here. And you can see that working mod 11, uh, you'll get seven minus seven, which is zero, six minus one, which is five, nine minus four, nine minus five, which is four, and then three plus one, which is four as well. Let's do that for the third row as well. We're gonna minus eight, that's an easy one. But then we're gonna do eight times eight, which is 64. Uh, we could take away, for example, 66, that's a multiple there. And so we, instead of subtracting 64, we could actually add two to, uh, now we do the same arithmetic mod 11. Uh, the next one, right, seven times six, or seven times eight, excuse me, that gives us 56. 56, if you take away 55, that gives you a one. So we're gonna subtract a one still. And then lastly, if you take three times eight, that's 24, take away 22. Uh, two is congruent to, uh, sorry, 24 is congruent to two mod 11. So we're gonna subtract two. And so that's gonna give us eight minus eight, which is a zero, seven plus two, uh, which is a nine. And the reason we did that is because we got seven minus a negative two, uh, which is where the plus two came from. 6 minus 1, which is 5, and then 7 minus 2, which is 2. So the arithmetic is a little bit different working mod 11, but we still we still get the same thing right there. Moving to the pivot position in 2, 2, uh, how do we get rid of the 9 right down here? Be a little bit more careful. we got to take row 3 minus 9 over 5 row 2. Now, whenever you're working mod, 
uh, anything, mod 11. We don't really want fractions. Can we write nine fifths instead as something else? Like, for example, the numerator nine can be replaced with any number which is congruent to nine mod 11. So we could add multiples of 11 or subtract multiples of 11 from the denominator if it helps. For example, nine plus 11 is 20. And 20 is divisible as just usual integers. This is gonna give you four when you're working mod 11. And therefore, instead of saying we're gonna subtract nine fourths, I think it's gonna be a little bit easier to think of as we're gonna take four times row two. And I want you to confirm that, right? If you take nine and you subtract from it four times five, this is gonna give you nine minus 20 which is equal to negative 11, which is the same thing as zero, working mod 11, right? And so that uh, subtracting four times row two will in fact do it for us. So now let's do the next ones. If you take four times four, that's a negative 16. Uh, but 16, of course, take away 11 is gonna be five. So really we're going to subtract five. I always like to reduce along the way if I can. And then the next one's also subtract five. And so you can see that all of these numbers are gonna cancel out, leaving us a row of zeros in the bottom. Now, in order to determine whether we belong to the column space or not, we just have to make sure that this equation AX equals B is consistent. And we can determine consistency from echelon form. Now our matrix is in echelon form. We see the pivots in the first and second column. There's no pivot in the third column, but as we do have a row of zeros, you know that's not a problem. There's no inconsistency. So because the system is consistent, we then see that B does in fact belong to the column space of A, which is what we were trying to determine. So we are able to find out whether B belongs to this, this subspace or not. And in general, if you wanted to see if, if a, a, let's say you have some vector space W, right? Some subspace, and we know it's equal to a span of vectors. Let's call those vectors A1, a2 up to say a n like so and you want to know does b belong to this vec to this subspace well if you have a spanning set what you can do is you can always create a matrix whose column vectors are the spanning set in question right here and then to solve or to determine whether b belongs to the subspace or not we then just have to solve the equation ax equals b so in fact, determining whether a vector belongs to a subspace or not comes down to solving a linear system of equations. This is of course possible only when we have a spanning set for the subspace, but we'll see in the future that that's actually not too steep of a restriction whatsoever.